Hello, my name is Dr. Harvey Joning. The following video contains highlights of graduate courses that I teach and continuing education workshops that I present for mental health workers regarding the neurobiology of close human relationships or simply the brain in love. If you are interested in these materials, please contact me by email or phone. Human beings flirt in a very specific way that looks just like the baboons that we saw in Africa. So when we walk in through, what happens? She smiles, she lifts her eyebrows, she raises her shoulders, and she tosses her hair. Baboon females do the same thing. You can see them out there doing this kind of gesture. <laughs> just watch yourself and watch it. Just next time you go into a bar, watch for these days. He walks up to her, arches his back, and thrusts his upper body in her direction. So young guys do that with young women. They're not consciously aware that they're doing it, but they do it. This, these are ancient behaviors that we have uh, inherited from our other, uh, from other primates uh, who are our close cousins. Okay. I want to uh, demonstrate something else here that is important enough to, to understanding how relationships work. I'm putting one foot in front of another, and I'm walking through the room, moving back and forth, demonstrating individual behavior. This is a very complicated process. There are many organ systems in my body that have to work in synchrony with one another. <coughs> and the timing isn't just right, I'll fall flat on my face. Fortunately, the cerebellum back here helps me move around without having to think about it. It's difficult for a person, a little baby, to learn to walk. Just watch a little, little, uh, little girl, a little boy, trying to get up on their feet for the first time. Very complicated, but then eventually they figure it out. What gets even more interesting, though, is when you start adding other people to the mix. So if we add a, a second person in a relationship, suddenly we need to start coordinating our behavior one with another so that we can go through the dance of a relationship without having any problems communicating and interacting with each other over time. So you can think of a relationship as like a careful dance with another person. Thank you, my dear. The amount of activity in the ventral tegmental area down here. Remember, that's right at the top of your brainstem. It's sitting right on the top of your brainstem. And it's, it's a key, uh, or a, 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 a key pass-through from your central nervous system to the rest of your brain. So in that area of the brain, uh, a lot of activity is occurring. That area of the brain is talking to the nucleus accumbens, and as you may recall, that's the part of the brain that can really pump up the amount of dopamine in your body. So if the ventral tegmental area is talking to the nucleus accumbens, you're going to feel good because you're going to get all this uh, uh, dopamine floating around in your system. So this is the same reward system that fires when you take a line of cocaine. And again, I wouldn't recommend cocaine. Lovers are much better for your body than taking cocaine. But it, the, the reaction is the same. That's why drugs are so highly addictive, because they're jumping on board the same pleasure system that's involved in falling in love. When you move into a relationship with another person, you have to make sure that this person is safe for you to be around. Danger does not mix well with a developing love relationship. So how do you how do you know that this person is a safe person for you to hang around with? Well, that's where the amygdala comes in. The amygdala is the watchdog of our body. It is constantly monitoring the environment around us to make sure that it is safe for us to be where we are at any point in time. So the amygdala's job is to first to look for ambiguity. Ambiguity is something that is on Familiar, something that I don't quite understand. So you go to a cocktail party and you start talking to another person and you, you find him or her kind of interesting, but you move in, you start to talk to them and there's just something jicky about this dude or this gal and 
Oh, I'm not sure. That's your amygdala saying, okay, be careful. There's something funny going on here. I, uh, I'm not sure this person is safe. So if that happens, it's very unlikely that you're going to move into a, a love relationship with that person because you have to feel safe from the get-go for love to really emerge. Now, sometimes people will get into a relationship with a person for all the wrong reasons. They are desperate for someone to live with or to uh, provide for them, so they'll put up with a lot of nonsense to get the resources they need to survive. I'm talking about moving into a true love relationship where you feel comfortable with another person. So if there's any ambiguity, uh, that's going to be problematic for, your, for you because your amygdala is going to start pushing you away from that person. Ambiguity takes away a sense of security. If you don't feel secure with a person, you're not going to allow yourself to be vulnerable in their presence. And remember, as we move into a relationship, we're going to become physically intimate with that person, which means we're going to be very vulnerable physically and sexually. So if the amygdala ain't happy, your, your relationship's not going to go anywhere. The amygdala is very a very interesting organ to study. As you meet someone, again, at a party, or maybe you're at a, at a coffee shop, and you start up a conversation with someone who might, uh, looks like might be a romantic interest to you, the amygdala quite literally turns up the volume on your ability to hear, five to ten fold. So as you start focusing on that person, you are hearing them much better than if you were just passing them on the street. As soon as you start focusing on that person, the amygdala turns up the volume so you can hear them better. It also decreases your visual acuity. You will focus on their facial expressions. You'll focus on their body movement. You'll become much more sensitive, three or four times more sensitive to what their body is doing, the signals that it is sending to you as an observer. Now that is crucial. Your brain needs to be fine-tuning itself to what's going on in that other person so that you can coordinate your behavior with them, so that you can get to know them better. The amygdala then is helping us increase our sensitivity so that we can pay really close attention to what's happening as we engage this other person. Okay. Let's say that the amygdala is happy. We meet someone, we feel comfortable with them, there's no ambiguity, they seem to be a straight forward person, we can understand them, we feel safe in their presence, and we find them interesting. Our seeking circuit is up, our curiosity is up, and our lust circuit is up, and our amygdala is happy. It says, oh, okay, go for it, man, go for it, gal. This person is safe for you to approach, at least for the time being. When that happens, the hypothalamus, which is connected to the amygdala, gets a signal from the amygdala, hey, this is a goal, let's, let's uh, make our body feel better. The hypothalamus then instructs our endocrine glands, which are spaced all through our body, to start dumping hormones into our bloodstream. And one of, the, one of the hormones that it dumps is more dopamine, which gives us a really happy sense, a pleasurable sense, as we experience this other person. The hypothalamus also stimulates the release of endorphins. Endorphins are natural opioids that exist in our body. These opioids, when they hit our brain and hit our, the rest of the organs in our body, they, it makes us feel really, really good. It gives us this nice, warm feeling. So when you have both dopamine and endorphins flowing through your bloodstream, it feels really good. If the reason that you're feeling really good is this person you're spending time with, they're attentive to you. They seem to be interested in you. You seem to be interested in them. You have things in common. You start talking about your past. You share all kinds of stories. And you start talking about things that you can do together. And you actually start doing things together. You're getting a constant rush of dopamine and endorphins, especially in the first two or three months of your relationship. That's why people get so excited about spending time with that person. They become attracted to them. They, they're calling them up, they're texting them, they're sending emails, they're going by their house, they're spending a lot of time with each other because you're getting this rush of pleasure hormones floating around in your system. That's a good thing. Unfortunately, that's not going to last 
forever unless other things start to happen to make your love relationship grow. So we're going to be moving from this initial lust and attraction to starting to build a much more long-term relationship. Over the last 47 years, I have been interviewing couples in long-term happy marriages. These are couples who have been together for at least 40 years and are still happy. You might think, oh my God, how did they manage that? But they, there are people who do manage to stay together that long and stay very happy. There's roughly 7 to 10% of couples who enter a relationship have these long-term happy marriages. Uh, my team and I have, have interviewed over 200 such couples all over the United States. Colleagues of mine in other parts of the United States and Europe have done similar studies. And this is what we found. If you are in a long-term happy marriage for a long period of time, you probably have values and attitudes that are very similar to one another. You like the same things, you have the same kinds of preferences. That simply makes sense, otherwise you wouldn't stay together for a long period of time. These couples also have a very deep sense of commitment to one another. They're very dedicated one to the other. When we look at their brain scans and what's going on inside their body, they look very much like people who are addicted to drugs. Do you ever think about your lover being a drug? That's how your body's reacting to your lover, as if they are a drug that's giving you a good fix. Uh, that's fine because our bodies are designed to have this addictive kind of interaction with another person. The more we are involved with them, the more we interact with them, the more pleasure we feel in that relationship and it makes our bodies healthy and it keeps us feeling really good. Now, if you take street drugs and throw them in your body, put them in your brain, they will initially stimulate the same kind of effect that you get from having a good relationship with another person Unfortunately, they tend to burn out receptor sites and make your brain not function very well over a long period of time. So people end up taking more and more of the drug to get less and less of an effect, and when they try to stop taking the drug, they go into withdrawal. If you are in a love relationship with someone and you fall out of love for some reason, or heaven forbid your, your loved one dies, you also go into a withdrawal reaction. Very, very devastating to the human brain and body when that happens. So historically, relationships ended after 7 to 11 years because one or both partners died. Nowadays, we live to be 78, 80, 82 years of age. Holy cow, that's three or four lifetimes of a relationship. So what, what is it all about in the human condition these days? Oxytocin plays an important role. As long as you continue to get an oxytocin rush from your partner, you're going to stay bonded with that partner. You're going to continue to have your seeking expectancy circuit up because you're anticipating reward every time you're with this person. As you engage with them, if you find them uh, physically and emotionally exciting, you might be sexually involved with them, which gives you even more of an oxytocin rush. Just being with your lover, and especially when you're having sex with them, you're getting a lot of oxytocin into your system, which keeps you bonded. However, if things aren't going so well in your relationship, he's not paying attention to you anymore, he's not being respectful, or she's, she's so preoccupied with her friends or with the kids that she's ignoring me, the oxytocin levels in our body start to drop. When they get to a certain point, when they drop to a certain point, people then, without being consciously aware of it, start seeking other people. The seeking circuit becomes reactivated, and you're looking for a potential, a potential mate other than the one that you're already with. 